Oh my gosh. I'm nervous. And then if we talk like this, yeah. I think it should pick up fine. Cool. So, hello. This is John. Hello, John. Hey, hello. Joining me for a conversation today. Just gonna hang out, talk for a bit, and see where it goes, I guess. Super stoked to be here. Thank yeah. you for having me. Yeah, of course. So, I think we should start off with your story. Okay. And like, right from like where you grew up, when you grew up, all the way through, and then from there we can, you know, kind of right where everything goes. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah so as Liam mentioned, my name is John. Uh, I'm a two time Paralympic snowboarder living in Whistler, British Columbia. I initially met me and Liam about six, seven years ago, and we've been friends, roommates, godfather to my dog. Um, but yeah, my journey started in Armprior, Ontario. Well, it actually started in Winnipeg, Manitoba. That's where you were born, eh? Yeah, so yeah, I was born yeah. in Winnipeg, Manitoba, where the Jets play, so yeah. secretly a fan of them. Yeah. And then, my, and we were living there because my dad was in the military. And so after living in Winnipeg for a year, my sister and I were both there. I had a sister, shout out to Alex. Moved over to Germany, spent a little bit of time there while my dad finished off his career in the military. And then we settled in Ottawa, in the capital of Canada, Ottawa, where my dad had a federal job with the government flying planes. So that provided our family with a, you know, stereotypical, you know, house and two kids and mom yeah. and dad, and we had a very happy family. and. Um, we, uh, we actually didn't live right in Ottawa. We lived in a small town outside of Ottawa. My parents did the commute into the city. And uh, I was, like, bred into playing hockey with all of my friends. Yeah. And so that's, there. yeah. So yeah. that's what, like, that was my first introduction to sport was hockey. And, you know, when you're a little kid, you don't even know at the time, like, what you're really getting from sport. Like, it's just fun. But yeah. when I look back on it and reflect, it's, you know... I am a people person. I love being on a team. I love playing with people. Yeah. Um, so I love that aspect. I liked, you know, I mean, being outside or being in a rink, you know, pond hockey or indoor hockey. Um, and yeah, it was always like a good excuse to get time away from reality. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so yeah, playing hockey, uh, things got like serious at like 10 yeah. <laughs> because you oh, know having fast because like you know the standard just gets high like yeah. kids are going to hockey camp and if you're not going to hockey camp then you're never going to be the slowest kid on the well, ice like, play with your friends everyone's going through it like from different leagues and stuff yeah and stay with everyone. so i was um doing some off-season training which sounds crazy to me now at 10, 10 years old, old. <laughs> yeah and uh, i developed a bump under my left knee and yeah. uh, at first we just thought it was a sports injury from overexertion and just using it too much yeah um but luckily, the, the place that we went to said that they don't like to mess around with that sort of stuff. Like, always yeah. see a doctor first, which was, like, good on them. Yeah. Uh, so we went to my family doctor. He caught it right away, and it turned out that I had osteogenic sarcoma, which is a type of bone cancer. Yeah. It's the same type of cancer that Terry Fox had. Okay. So, yeah, that was definitely a lot to take in. Um, but, again... As a 26-year-old, reflecting back, yeah, looking back, back we had you know really supportive community being in a small town. Um, yeah. My parents were together. They both had good jobs. My dad had good insurance. And you know um, the important thing was that we, we didn't lose each other as a family and that we got through it uh, and stronger at the other end. So yeah. it wasn't the funnest year of my life, that's for sure. No. But I think that I learned a lot of life lessons and I became very close with my family and community and it's really set up my platform for who I've wanted to be going into adulthood. Yeah. So you had osteogenic sarcoma yeah. at 10 years old. Yes. Wow. Yeah. And then my leg, I had my, so I had three options for, yeah. for an amputation. We'll throw a link in the bio. Uh, the first. Great to link, like your, what, the Lululemon video you did? The Lu, I did a Lu, I did a Lululemon oh, Which one was the one? Oh, but within when you go to Rainbow Park and you're on the dock. Oh, the CBC. CBC. Mm -hmm. That'd be a good one because you get a good view of the foot. Yeah. Well, which yeah. Frank, sure Frank, Frank, Frank the foot. Frank the foot. Yeah. So, yeah. so I had three surgery options. Um, so the first one and the easiest one, super straightforward, was a above knee straight amputation. Yeah. Probably most people should know what that is. Yeah. The second option, which is much much more complicated and would have involved me having to go down to the states for surgery and okay. pretty much my parents remortgaging the house. It's expensive. Uh, yeah. yeah, so mm -hmm. it was a bone, it was a new type of technology, a bone that goes in and replaces the dead bone, 
and, and it has magnets for lengthening. So they're trying to limit oh. how much surgery you'd have to do because at 10 years old, you're still gonna do a bunch of growing. Yeah. Um, and the problem with doing anything internal is you have to go in and have surgery every couple months to lengthen the parts and pieces. Oh, so it's not like a sim like a knee replacement you get when you're 50 years old yeah. or 60. But it's yeah, like you have to grow with it. And okay. so it would just, and it was like no sport really, like lucky to be, you know, walking a dog type oh, of thing. No way. So, yeah. and it's crazy to think that sport had already impacted my life it's to such a point where as a 10 year old kid I was like no I don't want to do that like I consciously made the decision like that with my parents help that like nope that is not for my lifestyle yeah which le left the third option which was a very good option which uh, is when they amputate above your knee amputate below your knee get rid of your knee and put your foot on backward yeah and it's pretty freaky and not a lot of people do it um, but it was gonna give me the most success in sport yeah. Uh, so we made it happen and yeah. yeah, so now I put my foot on backward. What's and that surgery called? It's called a Van Ness rotation oh, okay. or a rotation plasty. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And it was uh, it's a 12 hour surgery. It was performed in Ottawa at the Children's Hospital of Eastern, Eastern Ontario by Dr. Warrior. Yeah. People like to know that stuff too. For some yeah. Sometimes. It's complex because eh? you have to fuse like all the growth plates. Yeah. Darcy Sharp. Yeah, sorry we designed to find your call, Dars. <laughs> we'll call you back later. Okay. Um, so you're 10 years old, you got your surgery. Mm. And now. Yep. You had a bend ass rotation as yeah. a surgery yeah. from in Ottawa. And yeah, so cancer treatment was, it's pretty big. It's like the, it's the same. It's just, you know, chemotherapy. Yeah. And after surgery, things were really uphill because then it was at least like learning about prosthetics and like yeah. what prosthetics I would use for different activities, um, going to physio. And then as soon as the chemotherapy started, stopped a year later, right. my energy just went through the roof. My bone density started coming back. Like I could actually start taking a little bit more risks. That's and when, yeah, you really get back into Yeah, things. and that was like June of 2004. Okay. Um, so yeah, so summertime was rolling in and um, living in Armprior, a bicycle can get you pretty much anywhere. So yeah. I had a special pedal made for my bike. Yeah. My parents put me on that and I was pretty much an 11 year old normal kid again, figuring it out. Wow. Um, yeah, so let me think about this for a sec. Yeah, so yeah, I did the cool. first year, Yeah. super baby steps, like got my bike, um, started going to, and again, like, Shout out to my mom and dad, because yeah. the, they, I mean, I wouldn't, they have knowledge on sport, 100%, but right. they've never, my mom's competed at, like, a, you know, a provincial level of ski racing, yeah. and my dad's been, a, like, a pilot his whole life, but they really understood that to get me back into sport, it involved baby steps. Yeah. So, like, the first year after my, losing my leg, I did public skating for yeah. example, instead of hockey. Yeah. And that was just to like get back on the skates. It was a low pressure environment. I wasn't yeah. hating it. I was having fun. And then, you know, slowly like year by year, month by month, like I just started adding more and more to the plate Yeah. and then adapting to different things. So like road hockey, I was always the goaltender because yeah. that made the most sense. And my parents were super nice and they invested in like goalie pads for me so that I could play, you, yeah. know, you know what I mean? So I didn't have that that financial or, or any sort of to stop from playing what, what I wanted to do and exerting energy. Yeah. And, uh, I'm saying and a lot. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're doing really well. I think your, your speech is flowing well. Yeah. So playing hockey with one leg. Yeah. Super fun. But there's obviously the reality that I was never going to play in the NHL yeah. or, um, you know, take it to any sort of university or college level. And yeah. that was fine with me because I was having a blast with my friends. I got to a competitive level in high school yeah. and, you know, t retiring to the beer league sounded fine. Yeah. But that left a pretty massive gap in my winters. And yeah, was way less sport than you kind of grew up. And there. I'd always been a snowboarder slash skier recreationally because my mom um, worked at the ski hill and uh, during the winter time. Yeah. So my sister and I were there on weekends, and we do we were lucky to be in the ski racing program, and yeah. and so I had the basic skills. But in high in high school is when I was really like, all right, like we had a high school team. Yeah. And, you know, I could go to the ski hill around my work schedule, around my friend schedule, around my school schedule. Yeah. And. Yeah, it, it turned into like that missing piece during my winters and um, it gave me some time off school with friends and I got to travel around Ontario and 
slowly but surely, coaches started to find out that I had an artificial leg. Yeah. Because I like to race on the high school team without, uh, like, lifting up my pant leg or really bragging about yeah. it. Because I, I liked being competitive with people. I think you told me that story. Like you're, it's Mount Pakenham, right? It's yeah, the home Mount Island. Pakenham. Shout out to Mount Pakenham. Yeah. And you were riding, um, so you are riding on the high school team. Mm-hmm. And you weren't telling anyone the end of it. Like, you're just ripping around. Yeah, like enjoying. my friends knew and, like, yeah. the, like, the teachers at the school knew. But yeah. our coach that would just meet us at Mount Pakenham, she didn't know. Yeah. So when she found out, that was like, her name's Cassandra Smith. Okay. And she was the connection to the Canadian para national team. Oh, okay. So she's the one that was like, the head coach is Candace Druin. They were yeah. girlfriends. So she used to live out in BC. She knew about what Candace was doing with her program. Yeah. So they linked me and I got linked with the world Ski and Snowboard Federation, I think, or whatever it was called at the time. Okay, yeah. yeah. And then um, figured out the process for getting me. Uh, you have to get um, like registered. It's like the movie The Ringer. Like, oh yeah, you actually have to legit go in and like, oh yeah, he's got one leg. Like, oh yeah, that you have to. You have to prove it. That's yeah. crazy. Yeah. So I had to do a couple silly things like that, and then. So um, that's to that's to get out. So like you were pretty much you're riding in high school. Mm-hmm. High school coach goes, oh my god, you have one leg, you should go and go to BC. Yeah. Is that when you made well, the move, or did you, you stay It back? was, you should be in contact with the para team. Oh, okay. She didn't really know what the process was, but she's like, god, if there's a snowboard team for di- people with disabilities, man, why are you not on it? Like, yeah, yeah. And I was like, I don't know. <laughs> you didn't know about it at the time. I didn't know about it at yeah, the time. Yeah. So, um, contacted them and found out that like the easiest thing for me to do was to go do a provincial race in Ontario and get yeah. points so okay. that I could be on the points list. Yeah, yeah, start and, off the process. Yeah, start off the process and then I was working at Home Hardware and I had yeah. some local businesses in our car like the Lions Club yeah. and a local lawyer's office pitched no in some money Sweet. and they sent me up to Lake Louise for a World Cup and yeah. I showed up, dude, with a pack of Pop-Tarts and like <laughs> two four of lucky lager because yeah. I was eighteen and I was in Alberta, so I could drink. No way. <laughs> and I had a Forum Youngblood one fifty four. Wow. With flux bindings yeah. and Jeremy Jones Park boots that were just totally thrashed. Holy man! And no wax on the board. To a World Cup. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and dude, I show up with people have wax tags and physios. Yeah. And I'm like, huh. Yeah, no, it was I've the got the baggiest though. clothes on. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I actually ended up doing all right. I came fifth in the world and first in Canada, wow. which for my first race I was pretty happy with because I'd yeah. never raced against people with disabilities before and I was really nervous to like figure out where I was going to stack up um, yeah. in terms of world standings. Oh, that's a great result. What but, was the, the race? Was it Bank Solom? No, it was a full on border cross at Lake Louise. It was actually one of the hardest courses that we've ever ridden. Like, they've really? gotten a lot easier since then. Yeah, yeah, yeah just. I, well, it was I mean, just an able body course. Yeah, and they're just like, okay. Yeah, give her. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> Holy man. Yeah, it was pretty fun. But wow. luckily, you know, I had a lot of friends that pushed me off jumps and. I was always like trying to keep up in the park, so yeah. Uh, and I saw the other people doing it with one leg and less than one leg for some people, like yeah, yeah. missing both their arms or missing both their legs. And I'm like, oh damn, if they can do it, I can do it. Yeah, like, you can get in there. Um, yeah. Wow. So that was all obviously, um, you know, that got a little bit of encouragement from Canada Snowboard to be like, okay, like yeah. he's at least got the talent and yeah. he got nothing else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it doesn't have the, the picture yet. But yeah. that's you know, like when you're starting off like that. Yeah, cool. so, but that's, you know, and that was the structure and that's part of the process and, you know, yeah. I think a lot about what we're going to talk about today is, you know, from that point of Pop-Tart, 2 four of Lucky Lager, right, to, to where you are now. me sitting here today with you doing yeah. this, it's been quite the process. Yeah, and dude, I bet. It, continually learning and growing and frick, I'm nowhere near where, uh, where I hope to be in the, in the next 10 years. Yeah, you got a long way from 24 cases yeah. and uh, some pop tarts. So. Yeah, well, it's, you know, still too far away once in a while. So what, you're 18, did the World Cup, went back home, Yeah. dropped out of, like, college. <laughs> you were just done. <laughs> dropped out of high school. Yeah, yeah. Like, because I wanted to go to, oh, sorry, I wanted to go to university, so I was okay. taking, like, a trigonometry class and, like, a physics class at the university level because yeah. I, I had, like, uh, you need to, I wanted to get on this honors program, so I needed like a 90-some average in university wow. classes. That's and crazy. And so I was pushing like a really hard academic side, yeah. and it was just like, I had everything I needed to get into normal university and college, so I was just like, 
So yeah. Yeah, didn't need the extra stuff yeah. to know where you're gonna go. Yeah, came yeah. out to Whistler in two thousand eleven and like from for a May spring camp. Yeah. And basically found out about the two thousand ten Paralympic and Olympic Village and right. you know what Sport Legacy is and how there's these opportunities for athletes that are on national teams to train and work and you know yeah. compete. Yeah. So it was a world that I had never been exposed to, I'd never even heard of, and I was like a little kid in a candy store. I oh, still yeah, do. Like, I drive over today to come over, and I can't believe that we have access to... Yes, yeah, so you would have came, came like... We live in Chekhamis. We live in Chekhamis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you would have came here, pretty much. I came here. I yeah. stayed in unit, like, eight or something yeah. for my first time ever here. Yeah. And for anyone that doesn't know, me and John lived together for... It was three years or something like that. Three years. Yeah. It was pretty good. It was, it was pretty great. Good. Yeah. I miss it. Yeah. Um, yeah, so came out, and that's when, like... If you, if I, I call them pillars now. Yeah. In terms of like, there's your athlete and there's these pillars that hold them up. Right. And you know, I had like some snowboard knowledge, totally. talent, yeah, in a snowboard, like and like, but like, fitness testing, like. Oh yeah, really, the whole. Oh, just what a training schedule was. I had yeah. no idea. Like. Yeah. I thought going to the gym was like, you know, an hour here or there. Like, yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, so yeah, I got my butt kicked pretty heavily, but I think that they saw drive and motivation and yeah. I saw an incredible lot of opportunity. Yeah. So um, yeah, I did the first like 2011, 2012 season on the development team. Yeah. And so I was based out of Ottawa yeah. and I was kind of traveling back and forth to Whistler and different contests and yeah. trying to figure out work and money and training and all how all that worked. You were in, were you in school at the time too? You did a bit of university? I started doing a little bit of college. Yeah. 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 I, uh, yeah. Because I figured that would be important. Yeah. So, so, I, yeah, <laughs> so I enrolled in a few classes and at this point it actually yeah. wasn't a Paralympic sport yet. Oh, okay. So it was just a World Cup circuit sport in 2011. Yeah. And then at the end of 2012, that's when I moved out to Whistler. Mm -hmm. Well, I moved out to Whistler, I think in the winter of 2012. Okay. And that's when we would have met. We would have met. And we, we met, like... Right here. Yeah, yeah. as well, which is crazy. So I moved, yeah, so 2012 winter came out. And then a few months later, it got announced that it was officially a Paralympic sport. For 2014. For 2014 oh, okay. in Sochi. Yeah, yeah. And so that was, like, huge. Like, that changed the structure of our sport. So like we want to give you guys more funding. Funding, opportunity, yeah. access to gym. Yeah. Like, all of that stuff was, like, an overnight change. Like, we went from sport development to high performance. Yeah. Just like that. Just like that. <laughs> yeah. And so I got the... I remember getting the phone call and just, like, yeah, it was, like, a... It was, like, one of those phone calls, like... Pack your bags and move to Whistler because shit just got real. Yeah. And like the like next two years it. of your life are about to be fully committed to this. And I was like, wow. wow. <laughs> That's so <laughs> sick. So I tried to do some online college. Yeah. And uh, tried to manage some things. And I got pretty close to finishing my degree. But one, one course away. Yeah. And that was a few years ago. So I don't even know if I can go back and do it. At that point, though, but, when, but once and you now find I'm, out, I like I yeah. don't know if I'll even go back to school. Right, yeah. I'm on such a different path right now, and I yeah, I still have so much that I want to do. That those type of opportunities in life, and I think again, like relating back to the dealing with a life or death situation at ten years old, like yeah, you learn. You don't even know that you learn to take opportunities. Yeah, like I could, it's taking me a long time to be able to tell people like. Well, it's just like, well, shit, like, at, like at 10, that's like a, that's a black or white situation. Oh, You're yeah. just like, okay, life is worth living. Yeah, like, yeah. You got to just take every opportunity that you can to have fun or smile. Yeah. Because you can be lying in a hospital bed having very bad conversations before you know it. Yeah, totally. So, so um, hearing that opportunity that like you can go full in for the In disabled thing. snowboarding. Yeah. And it was like, dude, I thought, I didn't think life was over, but I thought it was like, yeah. you know, I am a guy with one leg, like. Yeah, I live in Canada. Life sport. is great, yeah, like, yeah. but you know, professional sport, like man, shoot for the stars a little. Yeah, yeah. So to find out that this world existed and that there was opportunities was yeah, it was super crazy. And then well, time sensitive too at that point. Like it's like twenty fourteen. It's kind of go not go or no go, but like if you want to be as the best you can be, you gotta go now. Yeah, so and then the pillars, of, like yeah. time to sort out the pillars. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I spent yeah, two years sorting out the pillars. Um. So yeah, just you know, going from a young blood. You know, form young blood to a 
Burton Custom to a Burton Custom X to oh, yeah. my first Kessler, which was like one of the girl SBX boards, and then like oh. eventually working my way to figuring out how to like do my own custom board. Yeah. Um, bindings, trying to get like binding yeah, sponsors. Gear is, yeah. gear is super expensive, it turns out, when you need to buy new shit every yeah. year. And um, no, those are all like all big changes. It was all huge changes, but it was all super fun. And yeah. I was really lucky to have the support from people like yourself and oh, yeah, yeah. coaches and trainers and yeah. uh, anyone else out there that that's helped me along the way. I definitely feel like the tip of an iceberg. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so that was that was just a chaotic two years. Yeah. Um, and I was definitely the underdog because I was the youngest guy on the team. It yeah. was a team of four. So it was myself, Tyler Mosher. Ian Lockie and Michelle Salt. Right. I was the youngest, and I was the tourist, and my nickname was Scooter. <laughs> and like, you're the kid. In the I time. was the kid. Yeah. And, and uh, friggin', with some hard work, I got three World Cup podiums in yeah. 2014 in the lead up to the games. Wow. And so that was really cool because I I thought I could actually win a medal. I was like, oh damn! Like these are the same guys that are gonna be racing at the games. Like, yeah. And I just got third like yeah so um so good build up so it was a really good build up yeah the it was really fun the competition was good um sochi was an amazing experience i again like through sport it's been really lucky like that transition to high performance like all of a sudden we have access to yeah um you know okay and the way that works by the way is the government allots a certain amount of money for sport in Canada based on whatever government it's in there, liberal, conservative, based right. off what the people vote to be in there. And hopefully you pay attention to who your minister is and what their views on sport are. Government decides to go X amount of money to sport. Then there's an organization called OTP, which is Own the Podium. They're the ones that go around and look at every single sport in Canada, winter, summer, and their national teams and their development teams and figure out which ones are most likely to have success with the Canadian taxpayer's dollar. So when you're a development sport, yeah. there's very limited amounts of funding and resource to access that you have. You're not completely cut off, but it's harder for you to, to get some of those things. Whereas in high performance, you have yeah, yeah. access to these things because you're a part of a bigger pool. So I think it's a very fair system and I'm super happy with it. And you know, Canadian taxpayers should be too. Yeah. It's good to know how it works though. I mean, it people is. always talk about money from the government. It's kind of like... Yeah, people okay, always say that our athletes money? are underfunded and it's like, you know, there is a process. It does make sense if you want to sit down and like talk about it and look into it. Yeah. And I think we have a very, very good system based on the average Canadian's view on sport. Yeah, for the entire country. For the entire just country. Like the versus, individual or like, yeah, the super top dogs that are like, we should get paid like $100,000 a year. <laughs> yeah. like, well, you it's know, it's tough, the yeah. accountant in Toronto probably doesn't even know what snow- snowboarding is. Yeah. So Yeah, it's always a down. So. Yeah. So, I don't know where I was going with any of this. But yeah, take a look, make sure it's still going. But I think we're... Oh yeah, we're Gucci. What time is it? Oh, okay, we just got 20 minutes. So, okay. Yeah. So... So that's it, you, you made, so I went right up to the Olympics and then you're there. And so I was there. 2014. And, and luckily, like, because I had success at the World Cups, and yeah. it was unexpected success, I went from the underdog to the, the, the most likely to win a medal for Canada at the, at the Paralympics. Oh, okay. Um, I had an insane amount of pressure fucking hit me on the way there. Dude, I bet. And it was like... All of a sudden, I expected myself to win a medal, and you know, uh, luckily, uh, with you know having access to sports psychology, yeah, you know, it was for me really about getting the experience that I wanted to look back on yeah. in ten years. Yeah. So I didn't know if I was going to do another Paralympics. I didn't really know what was going to happen. Yeah. All I knew is that I did. I needed to drop in on the race day, and I was going to do the best I could. Enjoy and, it for what and, it was. And enjoy it for what it was, because dude, yeah. you you, you get to walk into it. Never in my life was I thought that I'd walk into a stadium with 50,000 people, yeah. like, yelling. Yeah. Like, in full Canada gear. Like, I watched that growing up on TV. Like, that, that must was such trip. a special moment. Yeah. And, you know, to be able to live in that moment, not thinking about the race day or not thinking about what it was going to be like when I got home to my friends and family or if there was going to be disappointment and just actually living in it yeah. was definitely the right call because... When I reflect back on it now, it was such a wonderful it's experience. A I met yeah. really good friends. There's connections and stories that I'll have for the rest of my life. Wow. Yeah, and I came seventh. So my goal was top ten. Yeah. So cracked that one. And in there. And yeah, like it was worth it for you. 
which it was amazing. worth it for me, which at the end of the day is definitely what you want to walk away with. Yeah. Different experience in Pyeongchang, though. Oh, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, with that experience, came home, you know, 20... Well, it would have been leading up to 2015, which is when you, like, you kind of stopped coming back and forth, and you decided that you're going to be full, full time. Full Whistler. Yeah. And that's when we moved it, pretty yeah. much. Yeah, so that was, well, well, yeah, no, so you 20... You had a place in Kusa, didn't you? Yeah, well, 2014 finished. Yeah. And I got home, and I took some time off, so I went back to Ottawa. I think I spent the summer in Ottawa. Yeah. And then... Yeah, I definitely competed 2014, and then 2015, I moved out here. Yeah. Into Creekside. Or no, I moved into Pemberton with Jason. Yeah. And then moved to Creekside. And then moved here. Maybe we moved in 2015. 2015? 2015, September. Maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That was crazy. That was sick for me. Yeah. I had nowhere to live. <laughs> <laughs> so I got a phone call on a Friday and it was like, said yes by Sunday. Oh, I was at an athlete's camp for him. Yeah. I remember. Yeah. That was, that was awesome. crazy. At the time, so you would have been, what, 22? 21 or 22. Yeah. Yeah. So I would have moved to Whistler at 22. Yeah. With the like, pretty much you know, compartmentalized everything that I had in Ottawa. And yeah. sometimes people refer to it as like sacrifice, but I'm really lucky to have good communication with my family and my friends. Yeah. And, and so it's not sacrifice or it doesn't feel like sacrifice because I say to them, this is a goal of mine. This yeah. is what it's going to take to attain it. Yeah. Do you want to support it? And yeah. if they say yes, it's no bullshit. And I, go, I have, and I move out to Western, I do it like, no, it's open communication. You know, as as whereas, whereas for some people it's really tough. Like it's a sacrifice to be away from your family you miss stuff, you miss birthdays, you miss parties, yeah. you miss engagements, you, you know, things that maybe one day I'll look back on and be like, oh shoot, I should have done more of that stuff. Yeah. But I mean, it seems right in the moment. It's it like, seems right in the moment and currently trying to fill my, figure out what I want to be doing in my community to, so that I don't wake up one day and be like, oh shoot, I missed out. I wish there's not any more of that. Because I'm still young. 26 is still young. Well, yeah. So yeah, 20, long. 26 now, I would, you moved in here at 22, I would have been I was 18? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And then we lived and rode together and hung out for a bunch of years. And, and now you're, you went to another Olympics, mm-hmm. Pyeongchang, mm-hmm. which is crazy. Yeah. No. The, the, yeah, the three years of full time from Whistler to Pyeongchang was trying. If I was like a provincial team athlete when I finished in Sochi, I was yeah. like, okay, my goal is to go from whatever provincial team athletes are doing to whatever national team athletes are doing. Right, yeah, you wanted to change. You didn't want to be the kid anymore. You wanted to be like yeah, the big dog. I wanted to be the, yeah, the yeah. senior guy. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, moving in here with you and Mike was sick. Like, yeah. just being in a house of borders. Yeah, full house of borders. Yeah. 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 And, um, yeah, committing to a, a, a gym schedule, but then, like, taking out factors, like being close to the gym. Yeah. So, you know. that Just making things simpler. Yeah, trying to make things simple, trying, like what you do, trying to keep all that for goal. Boring. Yeah, all <laughs> for boring. Yeah, all for boring. It yeah. all goes into the, it into all the boring. Up. Yeah. And uh, I would say I learned that, you know, this is a, it is, an athlete isn't just someone who shows up to a contest. Like, it's a full circle. It's all those pillars. Yeah. Um, and... It, it takes a lot of support and, you know, learning yeah. and, uh, you know, still continuing to do it. Yeah. But the, the focus from, for those three years was definitely, I'm going to go and win a medal in Pyeongchang. Right. And again, being the general after the war, that was not the correct way <laughs> to, go, to go about doing something. I mean, uh, hindsight's always twenty twenty, but yeah, looking back, you think, um, but you're a competitor. Like, yeah. can you actually go to a contest and not think you're not gonna win? You know, as soon as you go in there, dead that you're not gonna win. You're not gonna. You already know you're not gonna win. You're like, yeah. yeah. What's the point of dropping in if I just doubted myself right there? Oh. I know that mental game is so hard. I think it's hard to say like to go in and say I'm gonna win this contest because I think there's so many factors, at least in slope style, being a judge sport that mm-hmm. are out of your control. But going in with the intention that like you want to do the best you can do given the conditions and given everything and then believing that you know that can put you up top or you know where you want to be is a good part but yeah i know that's it's a tough balance of like we actually wanting this wanting lot. to be there yeah and like knowing that you can but also having the headspace going through it 
to not get like put too much pressure on yourself and be in a good yeah. space to actually execute. And, and that's like, what I talk about like having really good friends because in the lead up to twenty eighteen, we yeah. had conversations about that where I'd be like, right. I just want to win it, and you were always so good about reminding me like, John, you just got to go and like do your best. Yeah, it's yeah. that weird double thing. Like when I go up and ride and have the best days and learn the most tricks, it's never because I'm like I want to learn the most tricks. It's because I'm like. I just want to have as much fun as I can, and then that in turn makes you lead to learn more tricks and things like that. Yeah, but I was better. I was too focused on the snowboarding aspect. Like yeah, like when I I was like, no, I should be winning because my riding bad. But like, when you say you got to beat like put everything in the snowboarding, the everything yeah. wasn't aligned. Yeah. When I look back now, like it wasn't all. Like I was only focusing on the riding aspect. Man, I was listening to a podcast. Yeah. We're gonna go so which, deep. Which podcast? Play. So I was listening to Joe Rogan Experience with Laird Hamilton. Okay. Um, and he was talking. I I instantly thought of you when I heard this, and he was talking about like being, sort of yeah, the full package athlete or the full package surfer kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And a couple of things he included that I don't think a lot of people do include is he's like, if you're gonna go in and like surf your best, because he's all about like maximum performance, you want to be like super fit for sure eating really well, but you also want to have like your head right in the sense that you know you've sorted your family, your relationships, all those things, so when you go out there, like, you don't have to think about any of that stuff, like your head is already in a good space. And Joe kind of went back and was like, well, like it is a good kind of thing to be able to, you know, handle that kind of stress, but he's like, yeah, if you're trying to be, like, if you're trying to go out there and make it easiest for yourself to do your best, he's like, sorting all that stuff out really helps. So that's like all the pillars that you're talking about is just making sure that you got Mm-hmm. everything sorted yeah no it's it's definitely hard to describe but it's it was uh yeah it was a learning curve yeah so you went into um Pyeongchang yeah wanted to win the medal didn't believe you could win the medal didn't win <laughs> the medal but learned a lot coming out of it learned a lot about yeah what it takes to be a high performance but still learning and almost maybe it's the reflection back on what I thought I yeah. knew that is allowing me to realize what I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Who so knows? coming into now, is that stuff that you're looking to implement? The things that you've learned through that and you're trying to get to the place you want to be? I'm trying to get more to like what you've always preached about, you know, no one's, no one's forcing me to pick a goal or to be a snowboarder or a Paralympic snowboarder or anything like that. It's, yeah. This is fully my, I've got to take ownership that this is something I want to do. Right. And you know, not half-assing it, so, like, I don't know if this is a good example or not, but this season just, you know, you've taken time away from downhill biking, Yeah. and, like, I've never understood that sacrifice. Oh, yeah. Until this year. Oh, interesting. And I'm not going to buy a bike park pass, and right. I'm just sticking to snowboarding, because I want to be the best snowboarder I can be, Yeah. and when I reflect back on the last few years, I've been trying to be a jack of all trades and a master of none. Yeah, no, that's a tough place to end up where you're like, yeah, you spread yourself too thin and you just can't, you can't excel at one thing. You can't even store all the fucking Yeah, like, especially <laughs> in something where snowboarding where you just like, it takes so many hours, like it's an hours game. So if you're spending your time here and there, like it's, it's all fungible, but if you want to get it to, you know, excel in something, you have to kind of give it, give it all. That's a tough call though. Like I, I mean, it kind of comes out of a bit of necessity too, where you're just like, well, I can't, you know, it doesn't all line up if mm-hmm. I want to get to where I want to get to. And it doesn't feel like people, yeah, people always talk about, I've brought it up a few times about the sacrifice, and yeah. I feel like the way I came at it was I learned a lesson a hard way. Yeah. So it doesn't feel like a sacrifice now. Like, yeah. like not mountain biking this time, we're not bummed about it. No, I'm actually, I, I'm yeah. actually stoked that I've had the realization that that has been distracting me from what my real goal is, yeah. and the potential that I can accomplish if I remove something like mountain biking, yeah, whether it's emails, working with sponsors, doing things like this, just being the snowboarder, yeah, John, that's what I think is gonna be. I really know what you mean. It like all those things have never felt like a sacrifice to me either because you just you see where you want to be, so it doesn't feel like you're giving something up. It just feels like you're going towards where mm-hmm. you want to get. You're to. putting more of your time and energy toward the yeah, thing and because it's a conscious decision, it's not like you're yeah you're having to give up something that, you know, it's just like, you're like, oh, well, if I do this, I'm going to get there, and that's where I want to get to, so it's just like... So I, I'll be yeah. a lot easier on... I've bugged Liam for, like, every <laughs> year since he's taught biking. To ride bikes. To ride bikes, and yeah. I get it. Because when I first moved in, I was riding a lot, and I don't know if you had a bike at that time. Oh, I have had every bike stolen. Yeah, yeah, you've had a lot of bikes. <laughs> <laughs> that's crazy. 
Um, but then as like, yeah, as the years went on, I started to bike less and less and you were biking almost more and more. Yeah. But I, yeah, we never lined up, but, but now we got to snowboard a lot more. Like we mm-hmm. rode probably more this year than we have. Yeah. Well, starting with Glacier last year and yeah. then again with Glacier this year. Yeah. And, uh, one thing, I mean, I think we've kind of, we've covered your, your come up pretty well. So we're almost in now. Yeah. But I kind of want to cover your, it's almost like a saga, your front three saga. My front three saga? Yeah, yeah, like pretty much starting last year summer camp till now. Oh, dude, front three happened. <laughs> front three, I have been wanting to do a front three since like I started snowboarding. Yeah. It's so sad that I can't. No, no, it. dude, I think that's sick. Like, <laughs> when you battle a trick that long, like it's good because once you get it, you're going to know how to do it. Well, yeah, well, t- it just means, like, it just, it's, yeah. Yeah. It's a great goal right now because it's, it's a fairly easy task that I think I can accomplish. Oh, I think so, for sure. But well, you've, you've landed it, like, uh, uh, quite a few, like, especially coming from, like, I remember watching them last year at summer camp. It was, like, a really lippy jump that we had up at Whistler Valley Summer Camp in the Glacier. And you gave them a go, but, like, I don't think, did you ever, did you land one that summer? Well, no. And like, and if I did, it was like super back seat. And yeah. if I was on any sort of transition, I would have just buttered out. You yeah. Know yeah. What I mean? like, but coming to now, you're really like, good at landing them uphill. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Like, yeah. You're on that. <laughs> but now you're starting to get like the axis and like, you've been putting hours. Well, it's just, yeah, it's exactly, it's, yeah. it's what I'm, if I were to take like an outside perspective on it, yeah. and I think that we jive really well because yeah. when it comes to meditation, yeah. it's like I, I'm not doing it for the hippy dippy. It's oh, like if no. there's a if there's a scientific purpose behind <laughs> yeah. it, yeah. and I can jump on board, perfect. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, and what were, what was the first thing for, the, for the front three? For the front three, yeah. it's like when you look at how proper snowboarding is supposed to be done. Oh and yeah. When you look at the way you're supposed to do that. Yeah. Trick. Yeah. And you look at my disability. Yeah. Like it, it makes sense why I'm doing what I'm doing. Right. But I don't think there's any reason why with time in the gym and time on a snowboard addiction board yeah. and like getting out of my comfort zone and falling and like, yeah, I can do it. And if I do do it, I think it's going to translate into my normal riding. Well, that's I mean, the thing like yeah, confidence yeah. wise. And just like, yeah, I just like the neck, what's going to be the next goal. Yeah. Y- you know what I mean? And then how is this all going to translate into my riding? Yeah. And you know, where am I going to be this time next year? Like, whether it's backcountry riding or park riding or racing. It's all just to become a more complete snowboarder kind of just thing. The, yeah, just the snowboarder guy. Yeah, the, the best one you can be. Well, yeah, for sure. Like, the, the skills you're going to learn from learning your front three, like, yeah, like, p- carving off the jump, popping off your tail, like, how you spot things, like, it's going to help in everything. Mm. Like, Keeping your back tight, core tight. Yeah. 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 Style. The willingness to take a slam. You were telling me the other day, <laughs> you know. You were like, I don't even care if I'm walking off this mountain, like, I'm going to get this thing. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah getting to that there. point. And, and that's where, you know, oh, man, I, the pod, the, pod, the uh, meditation. So Liam just recommended a meditation series to me called Waking Up with Sam Harris. Yeah, and I found that. This is because too. that stems from us going to see Brian Cox, who we're big fans of. Yeah. And a whole other episode. But... Yeah, he was just talking about, I had this weird moment where I was like visualizing snowboarding yeah, and thinking about just like, you can get probably to the point where even pain, you, it's, you know, it was like, that's oh, just a it, sensation of living. Is it like where you don't have to like You're identify with like like a, an emotion or like a feeling is an appearance in consciousness and you don't necessarily have to identify with that. Yeah. Or, or if you can train your mind. So like to positive stress, let's say, yeah, if you can channel it into creativity. Yeah. Like that's what I'm interested in meditation is like, yeah. Ooh, how do I go from being afraid to fall to just accepting that? Like, like th- that's going to, I don't know. Like, no, that, that was a big, I remember when I like, I remember he said it was to acknowledge that an emotion is just energy in the body. Mm -hmm. And so like, like I'll get anxious or I'll be worried about something, worried about a trick and just like, you know, that feeling that you kind of get and just use that as sort of separate the fact that you don't like it and just notice it as energy in the body. And then you'd be like, okay, well I'm just going to use this energy to like 
go do the trick or like visualize oh. it and make it happen. It's like a cool separation that you're like, you can get rid of that. You still feel a certain way, but instead of it being anxious energy, it's like it can turn to more positive energy oh. or vice versa. You know, if you want to chill out. But, totally. Or just yeah. like, I don't know, every once in a while, I'll just, I'll just look at myself and be like, protons and neutrons. Make sure oh, like, I should like, the like, yeah. yeah. Like, yeah. like, oh, I'm nervous that, well, at the end of the day, I'm just going to be a pile of protons and neutrons up here, or a pile yeah. of protons and neutrons on the ground over there, like. Yeah. yeah. Um, we should probably, yeah. So we went to um, the Brian Cox live show. It was like, what, last week or something like that? The 17th yeah. of May. That's what it was. And he is a, a cosmologist. Um, professor. A professor, yeah. Just real smart guy. Super smart and, well educated. Um, yeah, he's put a lot of time and effort into research and learning. Oh, and he's an educator too. Like he, yeah. he pretty Teaches. much like we went down. We both I don't think really knew what we were getting into. Like I thought it was gonna be pretty much entertainment, but like we I was sat expecting down. more entertainment too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was like it was intense. Like I haven't. It was going, like a lecture. Oh yeah, I've been <laughs> going to school in I don't know four years, and I was like, oh, I'm back, dude. I was like. Yeah, it was heavy. He just, I just remember him starting to talk and he was just talking so fast. Yeah. And I was like, man, he must just be kind of nervous. Like he's, he's really ripping. And then he just never slowed down. Never slowed down. <laughs> and it was like two and a half hours later and we just got hammered from like the beginning of the universe to black balls to everything in between. And then it ended like Where we are really philosophically too about it, meaning of the world. such a good, in my opinion of like. Yeah. Summing up the yeah two hours of fire hydrant drinking. Yeah. And, and just, just like just hitting you in the face. And then just being like, this is the point of all this. Yeah. That was really cool. Yeah. If you are ever into space or anything like that, he's a dope dude. He does the jar, and that's how we found him. We'll link. Yeah. So yeah. His put a link. his episode. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But he really makes you like like you said when you're when you're dealing with those like either negative emotions or like something that's just you're so fixated on and then you think about. Yeah, how we're all just he. What was he saying? He was we're all atoms, mm -hmm. and like your atom was like way back. It was a dinosaur, and then it was this, then it was that, and, and now it's you. But it's gonna be something else. I mentioned the sun's gonna explode. It's gonna wipe out the earth, and we're all just gonna be a pile of dust. <laughs> and we're, and we're gonna form small. a new star, and I'm like, oh. Yeah. But then you're just <laughs> like, well, whatever, you know, like this thing that I'm worried about doesn't really matter. Yeah, because it's all so big. Or like, yeah. and what I'm finding with the Sam Harris thing is like. That's the moment. That's all you've got. So if you're nervous, yeah, just be okay with being nervous because, yeah. like, in that moment in space and time, that's all you have. Yeah. And so either like use it to your benefit, or 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 don't. But like, yeah. Or just be in it. Yeah. Like, yeah. Be in it. Yeah. 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 It doesn't have to feel good or bad. Kind it's of. it's yeah. Being mindful is. Yeah, meditation is a cool thing. Mm -hmm. I definitely like. I don't talk about it too much, but I've been doing it for. Um, I think I started March 1st, so like March, April, May, three months or something. Wow. Kiss yeah. Second, like every day. Yeah. Yeah. I missed wow. two days. Nice. Yeah. And one day, I don't know what day I'm on, but I'm, I'm doing, I'm just going to try and do it for five minutes every day for the rest of my life. Yeah. It's pretty dope. I, I definitely back at, like at first, like I noticed, like definitely got crazy right off the bat. Like I noticed a bunch of differences off the bat uh -huh. and now it's like kind of plateaued, but like I'll notice the difference if I don't do it or if like. Yeah, it's just a nice thing to do now. It's just part of my, like, I just do it every morning. It's, my it's a, yeah, it's a good way to bring, I set, like to set a goal yeah. after it, too. Like, give me a focus for the day. Oh, nice. Yeah. yeah. Generally, it's it's really, I, I do it in the mornings. Yeah, I do as well. Because, yeah. like, you you haven't had anything hit you yet. You haven't set your metronome for yeah. the day, like, your pace. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like, I do it before I, you know, check text messages or Instagram or like give my, I, I like, I don't check my phone in the morning. Like, yeah. That's just nice try and give it. myself a little bit of time to wake up before yeah. I start to get anxious. Yeah. And with meditation, now I've had this like time to just like, I try to do it instead of snoozing now. Cause I'm a 10 oh, yeah. minute snoozer normally. Like I'll yeah. wake up at eight. If I want to wake up at eight 30, I'll wake up at eight 20 and I'll snooze for 10 minutes. Yeah. But now I try to just lay there and instead of waking up my body, yeah. I think of it as just waking up my mind. Have you ever had, have you had like a really sleepy meditation yet? Where oh kind of my dreaming? God, dude. I've had some, <laughs> yeah. I, like those are the those ones are I like crazy. the most. Cause yeah. those are the ones where I'm like, that was full flow state. Like lucid dreaming. Almost. Oh my yeah, God. Yeah. It's trippy. Yeah. Like he'll, cause it's like, it's guided. So he'll talk to you, but you'll like click in. Like he's saying something you're like, Whoa, I was just definitely dreaming when you're too tired to really meditate. But then you like, it's kind of sick. Like it gets you through, but you definitely get, I've gotten to the end of something like, whoa, 
Yeah, I don't even know if I was awake for half of that or, or what. But, but somehow you were doing but it. But it's still good, yeah. You like, you're still like, in it, but yeah, you're, like, falling in. Because if you, like, because, yeah, I know if I haven't done it, if all of a sudden I wake up, like, yeah, sleeping. Yeah. But if and at the end sleep. you hear the bell chime and you're... Yeah, you're there. It, you're still... Yeah, in it. Even if you're somewhat, like, sleepy, I still think I'm, like, well, I got something from that. Yeah, like, it's it's still mindful, like, still conscious. Like, you're making a concerted effort to do something, you yeah. know? No, it was... It's been... It's been cool to bring in. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a cool... It's all, yeah, it's all kind of for that full package, eh? All for that full package. Yeah. But I don't know. I guess to ish wrap things up. Yeah. It was kind of like... to make sure this is so really... Oh, yeah. Yeah? Wow. Yeah. We're rocking? Yeah. Yeah, we have a lot out of that. I think. I don't think I can cut anything. No? I'm just going to lay it rock. Well, you'll find out if I cut this. <laughs> okay. Um... But, uh, yeah, so, so, yeah, the, um, t- coming out of 2018 and, you know, not having that medal, yeah. it required a full year of, you know, obviously still maintaining my training routine and, yeah. and going to competitions, but a really big step back mentally, um, <clears throat> from, from sport and contest and a big deep dive into myself and what I want to be doing and yeah. what I want to be achieving because, you know, like I said, at the end of the day, it's like, it's my life. Yeah. So whatever I'm doing, I need to take ownership of. Yeah. And, and I want Some to be responsible for responsibility psychology. Yeah. yeah. So, so it's kind of been a year basically since, you know, over a year now since yeah. the games. Yeah. And, uh, I've spent some time in Vancouver, and I've now moved back up to Whistler, yeah. and the plan is to, Whistler is a hard spot to find housing, <laughs> yeah. and it's really expensive to live here, yeah. but I don't see myself anywhere else right now, and yeah. it's become such a key spot to my training that I'm going to make do whatever it takes to make it work, Yeah. and uh, for sure doing another Paralympics with, yeah. the, um, with the goal of growing sport um, within Canada for people with disabilities. More people know about it. Like, there's not going to be a kid. I don't want there to be any more kids laying in hospital beds and not know about prior snowboarding. Like, yeah, I want yeah. them to know all of their options. Yeah. And then I also want there to be, like, a, you know, a program within Canada for them to eventually get to a World Cup level. Yeah. Internationally, I want to make sure that our sport is safe, that it's growing, that there's opportunities for women and yeah. men and Everyone. people of all disabilities. Yeah. And, uh... Yeah, and I think just for me in general, like always wanting to be involved with sport and sharing the love of winter with everybody. Yeah, do you want to touch on that? Love of loving winter. Yeah, I started a non for profit this year called Loving Winter. Yeah, it's trying to get in, involved with uh, public schools, uh, mostly elementary. You know, um, grade four to grade eight type of thing. Um, yeah. generally schools that have a ski or snowboard trip already planned with a local ski hill and we go in and we use gym time to teach them about different terminology and balance drills and different right. dry land things that they can be doing to be prepared for that one day a year that they get to ski and snowboard yeah. at their school. It's just sort of better facilitating um, those out of school winter sport activities mm-hmm. just to make it easier for schools to kind of get kids out there. Yeah. Yeah. And or give the kids op- like the opportunity to not fail, like to turn it into more of a pleasant, fun, yeah, well educated. There's nothing, even as a kid, you don't know it as a kid. Yeah. But when you're better at prepared for something, like you feel more successful like, when you're doing it. Yeah, you're going to get better conversion rates pretty much. Well, exactly. it's kind of like with your parents bringing you back into sport, like, that slow progression of making sure it was a positive experience, yeah. you know, gave you that love for sports. And I'm sure it wasn't like, easy for them to freaking shell out the money, oh, yeah. like, for to, for that stuff, but it was so important for me to not notice the difference. It was important to yeah. have the... Well, I had the motivation to go and play. Yeah. My parents were like, let's keep we'll this going. Happen. Yeah. So we'll like, to balance that of, like, not throwing you in over your head, but, like, you know, making sure that you're still getting challenged. Oh yeah, like, like if I had to play, if I had to run, I yeah. would have just quit playing road hockey because yeah, it would have been was, like, oh, I suck at this. It's yeah. not fun. But yeah. I was a pretty damn good goalie. Like, totally. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, given that... Same thing, as snowboarding. Like, <laughs> not a very good runner. <laughs> but put me on a freaking piece of wax. Yeah. No, you can rip. I'll rip it down yeah. the hill. Yeah. So yeah, so giving kids opportunity, like, the, the smooth progression to hopefully more 
people being drunk yeah. kind of thing. The, the, this year has taught me with like, again, a ton of reflection and a deep dive on myself that yeah. I am young. Yeah. And, totally. you know, life can be short, but life can also be long. Yeah. And um, I, I love what I do. And I don't care if it takes a long time for me to figure out how to make it worth work with life and finance and yeah. where I want to live and how to have a house and how to have a family. Like, yeah, yeah. I'll sort that out along the way. And yeah, um, but I know this is what I want to be doing. Yeah, no, you definitely seem the most focused you've ever been in the world. Thanks, buddy. Ripping. Thanks, man. Definitely ripping these days, dude. Ripping. On hill, slash slasher. <laughs> slash slasher, dude. <laughs> yeah. Any yeah. hang times out there? Yeah. But I don't know. I don't know if how much I I don't want to take up too too much more of your time. How much time do you have? I I've got till six thirty. What time is it now? Six ten. Okay. I mean, we definitely ripped through a lot of. Uh, good kind of. I feel like did we do a good job of catching of like setting a ish baseline? I feel like we're uh, like. Oh, we're definitely. Everyone knows where I am now. Like, yeah, we're, yeah. we're up to today, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. No, no. You, your story leading up to now, I feel like it's pretty clear. Okay. I mean, we'll know. Like, the other people will be like, dude, you didn't do it. You suck, John. Yeah. No, definitely not. And I think we were rock, like, I mean, I was definitely a bit rocker at the start, but I think we, you know, we found good, good flow. Good totally. Yeah. No, I'm happy you, you enjoy like this. It's been fun. Mm-hmm. Good conversation. So many things that I don't talk about that we didn't get to talk about. I'm going to have to come back. Do you want to talk about F1, though? Real quick? Sure. Sure. I haven't watched any of the highlights. You haven't watched any F1 no. Monaco highlights? No. Oh, shit. It, it was, was super exciting. Was it exciting? It wasn't like. It was definitely one of the more exciting ones. Yeah. Well, yeah, because okay, well, you should if anyone's in F one, you should watch the video that F one put out uh, about Lewis Hamilton. Okay. And how he it was pretty much a miracle that he won. Yeah. Because at like lap, he had a bunch of failures and or what? no, so like they started the race and there was um it was when um Leclerc uh blew up his rear tire, put out a safety car, so everyone in, went in and pitted, but they put mediums on uh hamilton's car and everyone else got hards and he ran from like lap i can't remember if it's a lap 11 or lap 20 or something till the end of the race on mediums and by like lap no it was lap 11 they put mediums on by lap 20 he was like these tires are done he's like they suck like i can't drive these things and then he went from lap 20 to lap 67 and won the race Holy but it was crazy because the whole time like he's on the mic going like this is insane guys like I can't drive this car like it's under steering like, and he's got Verstappen on his back and Verstappen's like oh. pressuring him he's trying to pass him and it's Monaco so there's like not many places to pass it was yeah that sounded awesome that video like I mean I'm sure the race would have been watch but I didn't watch it either I just watched that video watch that video I'm gonna watch that video it's exciting <laughs> they do, they do, there's one part where they show like the tire wear yeah and it's like 0% from the front like they're just toasted and they're like just throwing rubber everywhere Oh my goodness! Hamilton's a genius. I uh, I enjoy, I enjoy F one. Netflix yeah. does a good job on their series to like give you the base information that you need to like. Yeah, drive to survive. Yeah, decide whether or not you want to take on a full on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we weren't in F one at all. Like what three months ago? Yeah. So, like, <laughs> I didn't know anything about F one. Series came out and then we just got <laughs> so on board. <laughs> yeah. Now you, yeah. <clears throat> but it's cool, like, from an athlete perspective, to have such a contrast yeah in terms of well like such a contrast but then such another contrast like no it's i mean once you know the way you'll see it and everything like it's it's all i find the same sort of like flow state being in it all that jazz but in a completely different like we don't have 500 people on our team and oh, a yeah. bunch of money oh, to make sure gosh. that we perform it's oh, just like, yeah that's the thing we yeah that's the sure fantasy of it yeah, it's psycho. And like For me it's definitely I'm like I couldn't imagine being a part of like I can hardly imagine being a part of the team I'm on and the opportunities that I get to do. Yeah. Let alone if I was like an F one driver that would be oh, the craziest man. thing. But also too, like it inspired like because you watch these like nineteen year old guys that I watched an hour and a half video oh, on, yeah. on the controller. <laughs> or on the, on on the, the steering, steering wheel. wheel. Yeah, yeah. And, dude, so and that was just like the basics. That was like, okay, how to get an idiot like me caught up to like, so I can at least watch it on the TV. And like, you're like, oh, he's hitting that dead yeah. lock and like, that's what that means. Let alone yeah. like actually having a knowledge of it and yeah. then being able to go like 300 kilometers an hour, yeah. getting screamed at, someone's on your ass and being able to do all that stuff. Right, I'm, like, I'm like, I'm like, should probably be spending a lot more time watching like, race footage of other riders. Oh, yeah, like how snowboarders. Yeah, yeah, or like, what What am I, what are some of the angles of snowboarding 
that instead yeah. of watching F1, or, you know what I mean? Like, I'm yeah. not saying I want to devote 110% of my entire life to No, but even seeing that, like, homie who had that fixed race set up, and he, how he could, like, s- that's in the Drive to Survive series, where he sits in this, like, fixed thing, and he's, like, going through courses, eyes closed, and he's, like, running a clutch, shifting gears, and he's, like, going through every turn, hitting every apex. Like, that's a crazy amount of um, um, visualization. But you, you told me you do that in yeah. these courses, that you'll, yeah. like, go top and bottom, and even try and get, like, this, a the similar time. time. on my phone, and that's that's what I did when I did that flow state thing, and yeah. got, like, the best time. That's an impressive thing to go through, like, like, I can visualize tricks and sometimes race courses, but I think it'd be hard to, like, do a lap top to bottom, get, like, a minute and a half, and then go and visualize the same lap and hit the same time. Yeah, well, it's, I didn't know what it was, but it's flow state. It's like, yeah. you nail the time. You know when you nail the time because it's a different type of visualization than just, like, going through it in your head. Yeah. You're actually riding it. Yeah, <laughs> actually, like, like, every, instead of, like, oh, like, this is where I pop and then I twist, it's like, yeah, yeah, like, every turn, every little thing. Yeah, but then you'd get rid of so many factors, and, like, that was the thing for me that I had to realize was, was like, okay, I don't have the wind. Yeah. So, like, that's going to make it feel slower in my head. Yeah. Right? I'm not going to have the many vibrations underneath my feet, like, anything like that. So that's going to make it feel slower in my head. So in my head, dude, oh, I am crazy. snailing. You have to, like, I am snailing it. down the run. It's like walking. I'm like... Yeah. And, th- and then that sensation, all of a sudden, you, you see things that you didn't even see in the corner or, like, a different line choice. Or you're like, oh, I could actually... I thought I had a lot of speed going into this corner, but I actually don't. And I could actually take this much wow. higher, cleaner line. Wow. And then all of a sudden you're like that movie where the squirrel takes an energy drink and that's what happens. And I can do that. In ev- especially Everything like banks, slows down. Especially yeah. like a, you know, a 45 second yeah. uh, bank slalom. Yeah. I can definitely, that's not, that's not too bad. Like border cross courses are harder for sure longer and it's just like more, more technical and yeah. then you have like you know going forward a time you have to try and visualize other people on your ass and then it just gets really oh, complicated that's, but that's tech yeah yeah the deepest i go is i just like watch myself do the trick just go through it but that's really cool you should start timing yourself from lip to landing and see if you can do it in your at the same time yeah. i always just try and make sure that i can do every part because i heard that like if there's a part that you skip when you're doing a visualization that's like the part you need to work on yeah. So if I like, can't see like a section in my head, well, I, I think you'd be surprised how if you were to time it, you'll be like, you'll be like, take time, yeah, and you'll look at it and you'll be like a second and you'll be in the air for like four and you'll be like, whoa, yeah, and then you'll actually start to realize how much, how much time you slow you're down in the air and how long you're spotting things for and stuff yeah, like that. and then yeah. and then I'll, and if you do that enough times, when you go hit the jump again, all of a sudden you'll be up there like oh. And that's what I get in corners sometimes. I'm just like oh, this was like terrifying yesterday when but I was riding this, seems chill. and after like. 20 minutes of visualization, I'm good. Yeah. You ever watch that? Listen to the, I think it's Matthew Walker on Joe Rogan, the sleep guy. Oh, yes. Yes. I rewatched that one recently because yeah. he told me to rewatch yeah, it. Yeah. Because it could have just been nine hours, man. 30% better the next day. See, I, <laughs> I am interested to talk to you about that because, dude, it is really hard to get nine hours. Oh, yeah. Especially without, like, a... Well, seven to nine. Like, you said... Oh, seven it's good. seven to nine? Seven to nine. Whatever works for your body. Oh, uh, like, okay. I'm definitely getting seven to nine. Yeah, yeah. It's most sure. people, like, under seven, there's, like, a very f- small percent of the population. Like, the amount of people that can survive on less than seven is, like, lightning struck statistics. Yeah. And then nine plus, I don't think it works. It's some... Whatever works for your body. Yeah. Right? Okay, cool. That's good to know. I, I, I don't know if I... I kind of skipped through it the second time, because it's such a long one, and oh, I was just getting, like... Bits and pieces. Yeah. No. Yeah, sleep is definitely... Rest is, like, so... That is a pillar. That's That's part of it. That is a pillar. Yeah. A, it's a ghost pillar because you don't think it should exist. Yeah. Like... No, it's tough, dude. So, like, because you feel like you should be grinding. Oh, all the time. And especially because you're going all the time, not only mentally going all the time, it's like you get a spare second, you're like, I need to feel this. Yeah. Something. Like, not biking. Yeah. (laughs) Even Laird was talking like he, the the big parts of like maximizing performance that rest and recovery is a huge part of. Like he was, he's like, I want to talk to Elon. Just let him know, like, dude, if you want to maximize your performance, just sleep a little more. <laughs> yeah, I think that's tricky. No, I uh, and it's like, and that's like with anything is, and that's, it's really easy to give this advice because I've been given this advice and I haven't listened to it. Yeah. But it's like, it's just getting consistent with it. Like, yeah, yeah. And again, like, like, 
how I felt about this last year is just like yeah. no one's choosing you to pick what you want to do or what you want to focus on like it's all up to you <clears throat> it's all up to you so it's like yeah if you want to commit to rest like yeah just make a move just do it yeah yeah but yeah rest the, oh, I don't know what I was trying to say there yeah. rest important rest important rest is hard <laughs> make it up you got zap underneath the table okay, so. sweet I think we covered a lot of good stuff. I was really happy to have you, John. Thank you for having me. If anyone watched us, thank you. Yeah, watched a lot of talking. <laughs> and um, yeah, hopefully there's some more. You hopefully you'll come I back. would love to come back. Yeah. I definitely don't want to be the only one on here, but yeah, um, William is a great guy to have conversations with. Thanks, John. Appreciate that. I'm really stoked to see what you do with this, and I'm yeah. excited to watch. Like uh, I'm not pro- uh, I'll probably watch this one. Yeah. Because. <laughs> yeah. No. But like I'm really excited to see who you bring on with next because, um, you're su- you're such an easy guy to talk to and uh, I think that uh, people will open up and I'm gonna find out some interesting things about my oh. friends that you have on here. Dude, even like we spent so much time together, I feel like I learned more about you today. So cool. Yeah. I mean, yeah. The whole idea is just to bring on all my friends and just have conversations, hang out. Because I think everyone's just got unique stuff and, you know, we've all had some stories and whatnot. Why not share it? Yeah. It's the only way to learn and get better. I think so. Put it there, buddy. <laughs> Did it, dude? Yes! Fantastic. First one. I just popped my podcast virginity. <laughs>